Hello, everyone. Welcome to our USMLE question and answer series. Um, today, we are joined by our wonderful USMLE counselor, Aksha Chaudhry. Um, how are you doing today, Aksha? I'm doing well. How are you, Megan? I'm good. I'm good. I can't wait to get into this week's question. Exciting stuff's coming. Oh, yes. <laughs> So um, Megan has already introduced me. My name is Dr. Aksa Chaudhry, I'm a counselor at St. James School of Medicine. I help students prepare for their step exams. Also like just um, general preparation or any questions you have as far as USMLEs or courses or anything like that, um, I'm available to help you out. Um, I do have two wonderful co-counselors, Dr. Already met in the previous webinars. Um, if you guys have any questions related to um, step one studying, even CK studying, or just medical school in general, we're available to answer those. So shoot us an email, or if you have, you know, our phone numbers, you can always call us. We love to hear from you guys. So for this week, um, the question has already been posted on Instagram. So just to go through and, and uh, to provide some background information and to go through the different options. That's what we'll be focusing on today. So the question at hand is a 44 year old man comes to the emergency department after a motor vehicle accident. The patient is unconscious and focus abdominal ultrasound is inconclusive. The patient's vitals are as follows. Temperature is 37.5 Celsius, 99.5 Fahrenheit. Blood pressure is 77 over 67 and heart rate is 124 beats per minute. The patient's skin feels cool and clammy, and the patient is stabilized with fluids prior to take, being taken to the operating room. During the surgery, there are multiple epi episodes of severe hypotension. Now, given this patient's presentation, what would you expect to increase of the following? 90 seconds to formulate your thought process and to answer the question. Now, when looking at this question, I always start with the last line to get an idea of what they're asking. So in this case, the question is asking, what do we expect to see an increase of? And all of these answer options are related to biochemistry and the biomolecular pathways. So within that frame, going back to the vignette, 44 year old man comes to the emergency department after a motor vehicle accident. So with motor vehicle accident, we're concerned about abdominal trauma, broken bones, um, anything that would cause severe injury to the patient. And he is unconscious. So based off of that, he's um, probably been through some major trauma, which is causing him to be unconscious. And abdominal trauma is quite common with motor vehicle accidents, especially when you're wearing a seatbelt. So in the ER, they did the focus abdominal ultrasound, but it's inconclusive. So we don't know if there's any bleeds or if any organs have been ruptured. So, um, and then his vitals, um, the temperature is fine. So we're not concerned about sepsis or, um, you know, any infections or anything like that yet. Um, his blood pressure is 77 over 67 and his heart rate is 124 beats per minute. Normal blood pressure is around 120 over 80, and heart normal heart rate is usually less than 100. So in this case, he's severely hypotensive and he's tachycardic, which suggests that he may have an internal bleed. He maybe um, has like broken bone, which is causing extravasation of blood, or there could be pooling of the blood in the retroperitoneal space because that's a huge space which can collect a lot of volume. And his skin is cool and clammy. This also suggests that there is severe blood loss. He is stabilized with fluids prior to going to the operating room. So that's the most likely course of action when a patient has a lot of blood loss, we wanna to try to resuscitate him with fluids. As quick as several episodes of severe hypotension, further reiterating that there is some pooling of blood it's not in the blood vessels, it's in a different location than would be expected. Now in this time, um, in this frame, now that we've talked about a little bit, the answer is adenylate cyclase. So why is it adenylate cyclase? The patient, he had multiple episodes of hypotension, which will lead to the activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. 
the juxtaglomerular cells in the kidney will detect the decreased mineral blood flow, which leads to activation of renin release, which is a part of the G sub S protein. In like part of this pathway include beta-1, beta-2, beta-3, D1, H2, and V2. The beta-1 receptor is responsible for the increase in renin release. The G sub S protein link second messenger system leads to the activation of adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP, which activates protein kinase A. So a little bit about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. When the kidney detects either decreased blood flow or a decrease in sodium, in the blood vessels, it will have release of renin. Once renin is released, it'll cause, um, it'll act on the liver to have release of angiotensinogen, which will then be converted to angiotensin one, go to the lungs and be converted to angiotensin two via angiotensin converting enzyme. Now angiotensin two is then gonna go work on the adrenals to cause release of aldosterone. And aldosterone is gonna work at, in the heart and in the periphery on the arteries to cause vasoconstriction and also sodium and water retention, which will lead to an increase in the blood pressure. So how is renin actually released? So what um, in this case, we have the macula densa, which is a part of the gesticulomerular apparatus. You'll have norepinephrine binding to the beta-1 receptor, which will cause a release of renin. Hormone, in this case being norepinephrine, binds to its G protein linked receptor, will have activation of adenyl cyclase, which will convert ATP into cyclic AMP, which will have an effect on cellular function, in this case being the release of renin from the kidney. So there are several subtypes of the G, um, G protein linked receptors. We have G sub S, which stimulates adenyl cyclase. And this works through the beta-1, beta-2, beta-3, D1, H2, and B2 receptors. With the G sub I, we have an inhibitory function of adenyl cyclase, um, and this is mediated through M2, alpha-2, and D2 receptors. And with G sub Q, that works on a different type of system where you have activation of phospholipase C, and this is mediated through H1, alpha-1, V1, M1, and M3. For those of you who have the 2021 version of the first aid, I believe on page 422, there is a great chart that further breaks down all of these. So I highly recommend checking that out to do a more in-depth review of these proteins and their linked receptors. Now going through the other options, options A and E, they're incorrect because phospholipase C, or PIP2, a lot easier to say, will be increased with the activation of the G sub Q protein link second messenger. And those receptors are part of the pathway, which include H1, alpha-1, V1, M1, and M3. For answer option C, lipoic acid is a cofactor for pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate. These are part of the TCA cycle, more involved with um, energy production, so like glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and those pathways. And these are not involved with the proteins linked second messengers. Now, answer option D, phospholipase A2, is an enzyme that allows for the conversion of phospholipids to arachidonic acid in the arachidonic acid pathway. And again, these are not involved with the G protein linked second messengers. And just to provide that information in more of a pictorial, the receptors that are involved with phospholipase C. So you would have your ligand bind to the receptor, which would activate phospholipase C, which would cleave PIP2 into um, DAG and IP3. IP3 will then go to the endoplasmic reticulum and it will cause release of calcium ions. And that works more on smooth muscles um, rather than within the kidney, because in the kidney for renin release, it's the beta-1 receptor with the adenyl cyclase pathway. And the arachidonic acid by phospholipases A2 um, into arachidonic acid, and then that is further cleaved in via cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase into prostaglandins and leukotrienes. These are more involved in the inflammatory pathways and in immune responses. This would not benefit our patient because he doesn't have an immune response. His issue is with hypoperfusion to the kidney and 
hypotension, severe hypotension. And in that case, we would have activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, please put them down below and we will answer them as soon as possible. Um, otherwise, we, you have our email addresses. Please feel free to reach out to us at any time. We would be more than happy to talk with you. Thank you so much for going over that. That was great detail. Love the photos. It makes Thank everything you. connecting a lot easier. <laughs> Now, biochemistry is one of like the harder topics to understand, especially when it comes to correlating it with clinical sciences. There's just so much money details, so diagrams definitely help. Oh yeah, for sure. And especially when there's multiple of them. And mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you for everyone who's watching on Facebook and YouTube. Um, we hope that our little breakdown um, really helped to understand what was happening in last week's question. Um, and to, yeah, further your knowledge of um, the USMLE style questions that you may be asked. So thank you so much. And we'll see you again next Thursday for a new question. Bye everyone. Right.